I'm an archaeologist, <laughs> study people who lived uh, in the past, um, pre-Columbian societies at the late end of, um, of, the, of uh, the time uh, before the Spanish conquest. Um, I'm working in collaboration with archaeologists at the Universidad de Chile, um, also at the Instituto de Arqueología y Antropología. This is part um, of the Universidad Católica del Norte, uh, but they're based in, in um, San Pedro de Atacama and also collaborating with scientists from the Spanish National Research Council. So I'm going to be doing um, uh, teaching and uh, research Fulbright, and my research has centered on looking at ancient economics and also ancient um, ecology, so how people interact uh, with their environments. So the teaching component uh, of my uh, Fulbright um, uh, stay will include teaching in the graduate program uh, at the Universidad de Chile in archaeology. And I'm just going to go over this very, very, very quickly um, on the archaeology of technology, so how people <laughs> make, make things and, and uh, do things. Um, and this is just draw some research that I've done, uh, mostly in Peru and then also here in Chile, um, on different kinds of technologies, including uh, uh, pottery production. Um, I've also done research on traditional beer production. So this is chicha, maize, maize beer. Um, and, uh, oops. Yes, very quickly, um, and on uh, uh, ancient agriculture. So this is actually from uh, my research area in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, and these are 500-year-old um, uh, agricultural terraces. So the research component uh, is on the political ecology of the Inca Empire. So what's that? We're interested in what happens to local landscapes, resources like water, land, and copper, and people when they're pulled into the Inca political economy. So when they're conquered by the Inca, um, who um, uh, expanded into this area starting at about 1400 um, uh, AD. Uh, their study area is the upper Rio Salado. Uh, this is um, in the, the um, Segunda Región, so the second region of uh, Antofagasta. And in previous seasons, we've documented Inca transformations in farming and irrigation systems. And oh, it's very uh, it sensitive. Is. Yes, it's it is. Sensitive. Uh, our proposed work is to look at changes during Inca rule um, uh, in ritual practices that are linked to agriculture. So we've been looking at sort of the physical system of how they've been farming and you know when they've been farming where. Um, but we're also interested in the ritual side of this because it's a very important part of um, of ancient economies is are is these ritual ritual practices. Uh, my collaborators are the um, indigenous community of, uh, of Aikina, uh, Diego Salazar and Andres Troncoso at the Universidad de Chile, Manuel Prieto and Valentina Figueroa at the Universidad Católica del Norte, and uh, Cesar Parcero and Pastor Fabriga, uh, who are uh, with the Spanish National Research Council. Here's our study area. Um, so here's Betsy, I'm going to be here in Copiapo. And we're up here, uh, closest city is Kalama. We're, our study area is right up against the Bolivian border. Um, this is an area where there's still some traditional farming and herding taking place. OK, so it's a driest desert in the world, but they're farming with water from springs um, and also using the springs to irrigate pasture land. So the, and here we're um, actually this is the community of Ikina, and these are the uh, maize fields. There are also still herding llamas in this area. Um, fun fact is that you cannot really uh, farm in this area without llamas because llamas produce all the dung that you need to add organic right, matter and nutrients <laughs> to these what are otherwise really poor, you know, thin, high altitude soils. Um, the other thing that of course drives the northern uh, Chilean economy, as Betsy was talking about, is mining, and it's copper mining. This is the Chukicamara open pit mine, and to give you an idea of the scale, this is a, this is a, a football stadium. Okay, for, yeah. For, yeah, it's kind of, it's hard to kind of wrap your mind around it, so, uh, but, uh, so, so mining is, you know, what, what today drives the economy in this region. But what you'll be interested to know is that in the past, mining was also very important. In pre-Columbian times, they were mining copper in this area. Um, uh, this is the copper mine at uh, Alabra. Uh, and, uh, my colleague Diego Salazar has been doing research um, at this mine for, for many years now. And they, in the pre-Inca period, they were they had kind of small-scale mining going on. The Inca come in and, and mining uh, increases greatly. So this is him for scale. These are the tailings from the mines. 
that they're take, you know, taking off these, the copper with just these stone hammers since we're attached to a handle. Okay, so it's, I mean, so it's pretty simple technology and they you know, took out quite a bit of, of copper from this area. Um, this is an Inca uh, mining installation here, the structure, some of the copper that's coming out of this mine called Cerro Verde. And so the traditional wisdom has been that the Inca conquered this area because they wanted to control the mineral wealth. Okay, and the thinking was that it was, you know, uh, taking out uh, ore for metallurgical production that would then be used for things like weaponry and tools, um, which you know, has been questioned a lot, of, you know, based on Diego's research and the work that other people have been doing in the area. Uh, so our work, uh, we were interested in, okay, so if the Inca are coming in here, we know that they're expanding the mining operations. How are they supporting these mining operations? So we were interested in the agricultural infrastructure. You know, how are they growing the food, essentially, to to feed this expanded um, economic um, development in this area. So we're working at a number of sites. So here's the Salado region. There's a modern community at Ikea. We're working at the sites of Turi, Topain, and Paniri. Uh, Turi is, was an, a local um, center. Okay, so here's a, a drone image, actually, that with the architecture, and then the Inca come in, and they raise uh, this whole portion um, of, of Turi, um, where, where there had been these ancestral burials. And this is based on uh, work by uh, 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 Vicky Castro and uh, Carlos Aldermante and their colleagues um, that was done uh, a couple decades back. But they realized that they, you know, they raised this area where the ancestors of the local people had been buried. The Inca put in their big plaza and a big administrative building. And then this is the Inca road. So if you were to follow this road, you'd end up in, in Cusco, eventually, okay, the Inca capital. Um, and this is the Inca administrative building at the site of Turi. So the Inca come in, they put in an administrative center, um, and then we'll, you know, our question was, well, what's happening with agriculture? We looked at two sites with these agricultural systems, Topain and Paniri, um, just to give you an idea of the work we were doing. A lot of it was just trying to map out the systems, understand um, how they were managing water, how, how they were farming, and what happened after the Inca came in. So this, um, a lot of the spatial work is, is um, uh, uh, being done by the, uh, my Spanish colleagues here, Marcelo and Pato Fabiga. And this is just one of the, the maps that we have. This is a, a Topain. These yellow uh, lines represent uh, the canal systems that they built coming from the spring. Um, and this is what the canal looks like on the ground. They're not very big, right? but this is a thousand year old canal. As you can see, beautifully preserved, which makes it very easy and, and lovely to do archaeology in Atacama because everything is really well preserved. Uh, and this is a field system, a 500-year-old abandoned field system at the site of Canary. These are the little little field canals, and these are the, the terraces. And here's that big um, uh, volcano of Canary, again, in the background. Um, this is some of the mapping work being done with uh, GPSs, and as I mentioned, also with uh, drones. Uh, we're also excavating in the fields, uh, in, in part to actually study the soil management. Uh, so I've been working with soil scientist John Sandor, who's been helping us to understand, you know, what they're doing to be able to farm over hundreds of years, okay, in what we think of as a very marginal environment. Um, and we also are using um, our excavations to recover uh, charcoal so that, that we can use for radiocarbon dating. And that allows us to date the changes in the field systems. So just to make a long story very short, what we found out was that uh, people prior to the Inca coming in were farming at the site of Topain. Um, so interestingly, they um, abandoned this field system at the time of the Inca conquest and developed this new field system at Paniri. There's all these unusual technologies that they're using, using there, not all, there's some unusual technologies that they're using there that make us think that they were bring, actually bringing in colonists from other parts of the Andes um, as they were developing this area for farming. Okay. Uh, so quick summary, they developed the state farm of the Inca come in, they developed the state farm at Paniri. Uh, we see this expansion of copper mineral mining. But then the question remained, um, you know, is, is a copper, does it have economic value or does it have ritual value? Um, you know, why are they mining all this copper? There's little evidence that, that any of the copper was actually um, exported by the Inca, in part because uh, most of the copper mineral that's being mined in this area actually isn't for uh, producing 
uh, copper ore. It's it's uh, blue blue green stone that they're um, you can use some of it to you know make beads and ornaments. Uh, but yeah. the primary local use in this area since pre Inca times are as offerings. Okay, it's considered to be food for the sacred peaks. Okay, and the sacred peaks like Paniri are thought to be responsible for human well-being. Okay, so they produce, for example, they are the source of water. And in the desert, you know, water is the source of life, right? Both for your crops and for irrigating those pasture lands for your yama. Okay, and so this, these practices of making offerings to the peaks to provide water is something that still goes on today <laughs> among people that are farming in the area. Um, this is just the, the, the ceremony that's uh, associated with canal cleaning at the community of Aikina. This is their central reservoir. The peak that they make offerings to, now they make offerings of coca leaf, um, uh, alcohol, and um, energy, you know, through song and, 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 and dance and, and their labor um, to the peak. This is the stone that they're standing on um, uh, in, the, in the reservoir, which is also seen to, it's, it's uh, also called Paneri, so it's the, it's the um, replica of the, the big peak that they're making offerings to. Um, so this is something that just drives um, the economy, so there are the ritual practices. So in other words, copper minerals are essential for life, okay, because they're associated with being, you know, being necessary for water. Our hypothesis then is the control of the mines in the area allowed the Inca to place themselves as intermediaries between the local population, the people they conquered, um, uh, and the sacred peaks that the local population uh, depended on. So they created dependencies of the locals on themselves because they controlled this, this stuff that you needed to be able to live. Um, it also allowed them to gain favor with the sacred peaks through their own offerings. Okay, the Inca saw these beings, the supernatural beings, as political players and potential allies. Okay, and so they're, by controlling the copper, able to then create direct relationships with these sacred beings. Um, therefore, we would expect to see um, uh, changes in the setting, size, content, and frequency of copper offered during Inca rule. So we'd see more offerings, um, and we expect to see them in context of associated with the Inca state. So we're going to test out these ideas at that site of Turi. This is the site that the Inca took over and put in their, their um, Inca sector. Um, and our field work is going to include um, mapping and reporting uh, copper mineral and other ritual features. And uh, we'll be excavating some of these features to be able to date them and to look at what, some of the other things that might have been also offered in, in addition to the copper. And just real quick, again, this is the site of Turi. We did some very, you know, some preliminary work in this area. Um, and a lot of the offerings, so there's offerings within the site and also on this area east of the site. And just to give you an idea, very quick idea of what they look like. Um, so it's a little hard to see because it's a little bleached out. But all this is, is ground uh, blue-green stone, okay, mm -hmm. here. And this is looking up towards Paneri. Um, it's a little washed out now because um, the, the mineral oxidizes with exposure to the sun. Uh, but if you look at it close up, you can see this is what it looks like. Yeah, cool. Um, so there, there's this area of these offerings that, um, that are associated with Turi. Um, they sometimes include ornaments and, and other things. This is pretty unusual, um, but it's mostly this ground ore. Um, the other thing that uh, just when we uh, did some preliminary work in this area, um, there's one site that I think might actually be a place where they're producing the ground ore. There are a lot of chunks of mostly of the waste stone, you know, from knocking off the, the blue green stone. And then there were ground stones. So it's sort of like the, the you know, the kitchen for the gods, right? Where they're, they're taking the, the green stone and they're crushing it to be able then to make this food that's being offered uh, to the sacred peaks. Um, so that's essentially, that's the, the field work component is, is planned for uh, October, around mid-October uh, through November. Um, and then before that, I'll be here teaching in, in Santiago and then spending some time with my colleagues in San Pedro. So that's it. And this is, uh, this is the view from Aikina, where we live. Um, so yeah, so it's a really beautiful setting. Here are the, here are the terraces. Okay, thank you. I guess we have time for questions. We, we yeah, so. we, <laughs> it's been 15 minutes. So. No, no.
use LiDAR or some form of that to map rather than GPS and drones? Um, drones are actually better because you can also through the, uh, so LiDAR you would, is, is great like if you have a lot of vegetation and you want, you need to get that, you know, topography um, with the drones, and, and, but, but you know, with a, with a LiDAR, you, you can't actually, the, if you had a photographic image, all you'd see is like tree, you know, tree leaves or something like that. If you had a lot of, if you have a canopy. So they use LiDAR a lot like in areas like the Maya area. Um, here, the, what the drones give us is both the topography, because they, they get the satellite images and, you know, with the overlap, we're able then to get the 3D and, and the image. So we get, to, so we get more information are they using the drones than you would out of out sure. using LiDAR? Yeah. But it, I mean, it's a spectacular, for doing this kind of, of imagery, it's spectacular because the preservation is so good. What about taking flyover with uh, optical, 3D optical on the plane? Then we would need to have uh, a really big grant to hire a plane. <laughs> 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 and all the permits to do it. <laughs> NASA First, does fly over once in a while. Yeah. Well then, yeah, well, yeah. well. Um, <laughs> I, I, then I, would, I would love to hear anyone's ideas about how we could get them to do it on the cheap. <laughs> so, yeah, to be able to get, to get these images. So, I mean, the, and then the drones are for doing, you know, pretty much low altitude um, images. And the yeah. site, you know, some of the sites are small, but I am curious about trying to do stuff. Stereoscope those been around since the 1950s for right. survey. Right. Um, so, but trying to do something at a more intermediate level where we can see more of the site is something that I'd be interested in getting people's ideas. So, I, I mentioned copper one is toxic to cells, yeah. and copper zero is anti thought to be antimicrobial. Could there be any medicinal reason for the copper mining? You know, like in terms of it all. I'm, I'm just. Right, I mean, I don't know whether that blue-green copper has any antimicrobial properties at all. You know, hmm. um, I don't know that anyone's looked into that, but that's a good question because there's all different kinds of things that are used as traditional medicine. Right, that's what I was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, that's a good question, and I hadn't really thought about it, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. So there's no evidence whatsoever for uh, I mean, useful things made out couple you've already said there. Yeah, ritual things, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah right. so, I mean, it's for the daily use, like a container, things like that. Because the rest of the world has been using copper for for some. So, no, so there is, uh, yeah. so there is some metallurgy in this area. It's not really good skill for every, you know, lots of, lots of you know, large scale production of everyday okay. objects. Okay. Not in this area. In other parts of the Andes. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Um, in pre-Columbian times. Um, and given the amount that you think they mined, they clearly did not use it. They didn't have the ca capacity okay. to use it for that reason, right? Is um, that what you say? I mean, it's, well, because because there is there, there is some metallurgical production, but it's just the scale is not is not big. And comparable. Then, and most right, of yeah. the ore that's being uh, mined here is not for metal production. Yeah. Great, yeah. great guys. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, thank you.